Dear friends, welcome to e-Patshala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidyapeet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module called Political Sociology in the Indian Context, which is a part of the paper Political Sociology. In this module, we are going to understand the contextualization of power in Indian society. On the one hand, we have pre-modern institutions such as caste, religion and other ethnicities which are alive together with modern political processes such as democracy and electoral reforms. How do these ironies come together and how does power get construed is what this particular module will be discussing. The context of modernization, democracy and constitutionalism. The political and social situation before and after India got independence in 1947 needs a special reference in the understanding of the emergence of political sociology in India. The basic framework on which the discipline constructs its understanding of power and its organization is by foregrounding the principle contradiction of the existence of the caste system in a society that professes to be a modern democratic republic. The caste system was structurally embedded in a hierarchical system based on birth rooted in privilege and which sanctioned both discrimination and exclusion among the diverse group and subgroups of the Indian population. The hierarchical division of people based on birth and occupation clearly represented a system of inequality that pervaded the entire universe of social relationships that make up Indian society. After independence, India took, adopted its constitution which declared it to be a socialist democratic society which gave equal rights to all citizens irrespective of their caste, religion, language, etc. Thus, on the one hand, there was the traditional Indian caste system which upheld a set of power relations that were both asymmetrical and discriminatory. And on the other hand, there was the adoption of a modern political constitutional system based on principles of equality, liberty, human dignity, secularism, etc. It is this juxtaposition of the traditional and the modern in the sphere of Indian politics that serves as the principal site of contradiction on which political sociology as a discipline has sought to develop its inquiry and knowledge base. Political sociologists in India were interested in the interaction between these two set of principles. What was interesting in the coexistence of these contradictory set of principles without either of them facing complete demise. In their political sociologist view, this was possible because tradition was molded and transformed in a uniquely symbiotic way to aid the cause of political and social modernization of India. This unique political and social situation in India could not be accommodated under the theories of political sociology which already existed and this was the background in which political sociology as a separate discipline emerged. It is based on this very situation, Dipankar Gupta argued that the phrase political sociology in India is more appropriate than political sociology of India. This unique feature of the Indian political system invited attention of many scholars from a host of different disciplines, all of them writing under the broad disciplinary field of political sociology. While some of them looked at the coexistence of traditional and modern principles and values etc., some others looked at how such a contradiction affected the process of developing a modern political system in India. Yet others looked at how these two contradictory spheres of political life, that is the modern and the traditional complemented each other despite the incompatibility of the values espoused in either of them. Rudolf and Rudolf looked at how the caste system, instead of working against the democratic principles of a modern political system, changed their form in terms of how caste groupings became political groupings. 
If caste groupings were understood as solidarities that functioned under certain hierarchical identities within the modern and political system, these caste solidarities transformed themselves, especially within the domain of political mobilization, to function as interest groups within a larger political configuration. It is important to note that within such transformations, only the form underwent a change, while the substance of caste in its hierarchical nature remained intact. What the Rudolphs emphasized here was the persistent centricism of the Indian political system. The factors that supported the existence of such centrist politics to prevail included the marginality of class politics, the fragmentation of the majority, the electoral strength of the disadvantaged sections, the increasing political consciousness of people, and the constraints on the federal system due to social pluralism and cultural diversity. They also point out that since India's electoral system is based on first past the post in which the candidate who manages to get the highest number of votes is declared the winner, hence political parties have to appeal to people from all across different castes or religions rather than restricting themselves to any one particular community. Such political mobilizations would aim to get maximum number of votes, keeping in mind the electoral strength of different caste groupings. Another interesting feature of Indian politics is group identity shared by different minority communities based on their common economic, social and cultural conditions. It is these identities which help them in strengthening their political participation. The role of identity, be it caste or minority, has played an important role in the shaping of majority and minority discourse within political sociology. Equally important is the way in which the inequalities of the systems are negotiated within the political system. Negotiating caste inequalities. In 1957, the Balwant Rai Mehta Committee, appointed by the Government of India, submitted its report which recommended the establishment of the Panchayati Raj or Institutions for Democratic Decentralization, which was accepted by the National Development Council in 1958. This led to the creation of new political structures based on democratic principles. Andre Bete has studied the effects of these new institutions on the relations between different caste groupings in Tamil Nadu. Before the sh coming of the Panchayati Raj institutions, upper caste who are a minority in terms of population dominated the other lower castes and Dalits. However, this situation has changed. today. Though they still managed to regain their economic and ritual dominance, they lost their political dominance to the non brahmins as they are very few in number. Thus, Bete observes that the introduction of new political structures and specialized political organs have helped the non brahmin leaders to come to power. He observes the dual effects of political processes on the caste system. On the one hand, by exploiting caste or subcaste loyalties, the traditional structure based on caste system remains unchanged. On the other hand, new alliances are formed cutting across caste loyalties and this leads to the loosening of traditional structure. Frankel and Rao in their work on the caste system also discussed the issue of dominance to identify the role that dominant caste and dominant caste alliances play within the modern political system. Across India, in the different regions, dominant castes who may not be from upper caste but who have achieved material prosperity through social and economic progress or transformation taking place in the country have played a significant role in shaping the culture of democratic politics within modern Indian society. The case of the Marathas in Western India and that of the Yadavs in the North India is a case in point that illustrated the role of dominance played by these castes within the modern political system. Rajni Kotari has tried to show how various caste groups and caste alliances have engaged with the modern political system such that they can extract the benefit of their position and numbers both from within the traditional caste system as well as that of the modern democratic system. The idea of caste functioning as interest groups within a range of diverse political formations in the modern context has shown how important caste identity still is within the electoral process of democratic politics. 
He says that there was never a complete polarization between caste system and the political system and that the contemporary process is a shift in which social priorities rather than a total shift from one system to another. He says that those in India who complain of casteism in politics are really looking for a sort of politics which has no basis in society. So deeply had the consciousness of caste infiltrated the modern political system in India that it was not possible to talk about India's democratic polity without at the same time talking about the role of caste in shaping of this policy. Protective discrimination. In a caste-ridden society like India to follow the principles of equality and social justice at the same time without making some compromises is not possible. It is because of the deeply entrenched inequality which was the result of the caste system. At the time of framing of the constitution, it was necessary to frame provisions keeping in mind the already existing inequality in society. As a result, India adopted a policy of protective discrimination under which it was decided to give reservations to the disadvantaged group in the field of education, government, jobs, etc. So they got a fair chance to compete with others and enjoy their rights. Galanta identified three preferences given to the reserve category. One, reservations to certain position and for certain resources. For instance, in the legislatures, government jobs and colleges. Two, provisions for them including expenditure on scholarships and loans, etc. Three, special protections to protect them from getting exploited. As the disadvantaged groups were the lower caste, naturally the reservations given on the basis of caste. This was extended to other backward castes who were identified in terms of the extent and nature of the backwardness. This in turn gave rise to an increase in the number of caste associations whose aim was to bring back the respective castes under the policy of protective discrimination. The backward classes too found their own identity as separate from the other scheduled castes. As a result of these developments, the membership in a caste association became an achieved one unlike caste membership which was ascribed by birth. Rudolf and Rudolf have pointed out how party programs may lead to splits within a caste and alliance across other castes. Anti-reservation movements. A major development in the political situation of India was the anti-reservation movement in 1980. The Mandal Commission submitted its report in which it justified the already existing reservation for ST and ST. Recommended 20% reservation for the OBC which resulted in an increase in the reserve quota from 27 to 50%. This was followed by wide protests popularly known as anti-Mandal. The protests were against giving reservation on caste basis and not on merit basis. This led to the resignation of Prime Minister V.P. Singh who decided to implement the Mandal Commission recommendations. Many cases of self-immolation by students were also reported. Major problem that exists even today is that the status of caste is not uniform throughout the country. Gallanter has pointed out that there were castes which were considered untouchable in some parts and had a better status in some other part. For example, the Dhobis who were untouchables in UP and not in Bombay. Though caste played an important role in the way politics worked in India, there were many other factors which were important. India faced many other disturbances other than anti-reservation movements and these need a brief mention. Atul Kohli, after studying different states, identified four different factors which played a major role in the crisis situation in the Indian political scenario. The deinstitutionalizing role of national and regional leaders, the impact of weak political parties, the undisciplined political mobilization of various castes, ethnic, religious and other types of groups, and four, the increasing conflict between the haves and the have-nots in the civil society. Many saw Indira Gandhi's style of governance as the cause for the crisis, but there was more to it. And this was a major question on Indian politics that invited the attention of political sociologists. Kohli himself suggests that part of the answer may be in the hiatus between the haves and the have-nots, which have continued to grow in contemporary India. 
failure of the state. Many have criticized the Indian state for the ways in which it had tried to unite different sections of Indian population who were culturally different. Kothari notes that it is important not to talk simply of crisis of governance, but to realize how the myriad diversities in India have been undermined and the interest stifled for the case for the sake of unity at the center. The state, though claimed to be a protector of everyone, in reality favored the urban elites and this led to a furthering of the inequality that already persisted. An exception to this failure of the state observed by Atul Kohli is that of West Bengal. This government is characterized by a coherent leadership and an ideological commitment to exclude the properties of pro property classes from direct participation in the governance of the state by a pragmatic attitude to the entrepreneurial classes which are non-threatening in character to the political authorities as well as party and political organizational apparatuses that is both centralized and decentralized. With many protests happening against different policies of government, a major question that demanded answer was the legitimacy of the government. The changing political scenario of India in recent decades, especially after 1975, made the question of legitimacy a very important area of investigation. Political sociologists who were primarily interested in the legitimacy of the ruling party naturally gave attention to such anti-government feelings. Major incident that swiftly changed a legitimate ruling party or a ruler into an illegitimate one was the emergency of 1975 declared by the then Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi. The emergency clearly revealed the dictatorial tendencies in the ruling class and the weakness of the state institutions within the modern political context. Yet, even in this very dark period of Indian politics, it is useful to note that when elections were announced, the Congress was defeated and the Constitution amended to prevent the imposition of emergency rule by any future government. The emergency period was followed by a change in government, but unrest continued to occur. In order to get a complete picture of the political situations in India, it is necessary to look at the different types of protest movements that took place. Ethnic movements. An important feature of the Indian polity that attracted the attention of many political scientists in India is the repeated occurrence of ethnic movements. Here it is important to look at what is actually meant by ethnicity. According to T.K. Oman, ethnicity arises when the link between culture and territory is broken. He sees citizenship as a solution to the ethnic tensions and as a means to equality. India being a land of diverse cultures, the chance for the occurrence of ethnic movements remain high. When an ethnic tension occurs, it comes with an attempt by one group to mark another group as not belonging to their society as an outsider. Linguistic, nativist and regional movements. Considering the diversity of Indian population, many were skeptical of the success of India as a nation. The partition in a way confirmed this doubt. However, the aftermath of partition saw some positive changes. There was more tolerance from the sides of both the state as well as the people. Deepankar Gupta identifies three different types of movements that mark the post-independence period. These were the linguistic movements, nativist movements and regional movements. 1950s was marked by demands from different linguistic groups who wanted the states to be reorganized on the basis of language. This led to the formation of the State Reorganization Commission and subsequently states were carved out on the basis of language. The accession of unilingual provinces with the State Reorganization Commission brought about an end to these demands in the 50s, except in the case of Gujarat, where the issue was ultimately resolved in 1966. In the 1960s and 70s, India saw the emergence of nativist movements. This was by the natives or the sons of soil who demanded economic benefits and non-interference of people belonging to other linguistic groups in the local economy. One of the best ongoing examples of this is the Shiv Sena movement which vehemently opposed the intrusion of people from other states to Maharashtra. Shiv Sena movement was founded by Bal Thakre on June 16, 1966 and its members accuse the non-Marathis for taking over the opportunities which they see as rightfully belonging to the Marathis. 
In 1960, the Bombay Presidency was linguistically reorganized into two different states of Gujarat and Maharashtra. However, in Maharashtra, most of the industries were owned by Gujarati-speaking people and at the same time, many South Indians migrated here. It was in this backdrop that Shiv Sena movement came into existence. This phase was followed by the emergence of regional movements in the 1980s which were heavily politicized resulting in the formation of political parties. The Akali Dal, DMK, etc. are examples of such politicization. Unlike linguistic and nativist movements which were in no way anti-national, the regional movements were directed against the center. These groupings were demanding for economic welfare and were not primarily ethnic or cultural in nature. However, Gupta observes that the government at the center tried to convert the regional and secular issues into ethnic and cultural ones. A good example of this is Punjab in 1980s. The Punjab agitation with began with very secular demands like Chandigarh, water distribution and territorial demarcation had over the years been ethnicized by the center to the extent that there was a time when Sikh extremists were seen to hold the key problem. For him, this attitude of the government rather than the cultural differences was the actual problem. Closely linked to this was the agrarian crisis in Punjab and Green Revolution. Though it was an initial success, its long-term effects were not satisfactory. It increased the gap between rich and the poor farmers and the cost of cultivation went up. This led to the process of de-peasantization of the peasantry according to Vandana Shiva as it was aimed at rebuilding on the best resources were allocated in favor of the rich farmers and even the subsidies introduced by the government reached their hands. The only option left to the small farmers was to resort to credit facility and as getting an instrument credit was a long and difficult process, small farmers were forced up to take up non-institutional credit with exorbitant rates of interest and the result was them ending up in debt trap. In less than two decades after the Green Revolution, farmers in Punjab started feeling victimized. Vandana Shiva observed that since the policies related to Green Revolution were controlled by the central government, the result was a conflict between the Punjab government and the center. She also says that the later development including Sikh and anti-Sikh protests and a revival of the cultural identity of the Sikhs more in response to the erosion of regional autonomy and the cultural and moral erosion of life in Punjab as a result of the Green Revolution and was not a cultural conflict of Sikhs with Hindus. However, the struggles of Sikh as farmers and as a religious community was rapidly communalized and militarized by the center. To conclude, therefore, we have seen how the contradictions of the pre-modern and the modern come together. How caste, for instance, as an institution plays a major role in politics and the democracy of India. Therefore, we cannot use a Eurocentric frame and a Eurocentric lens to understand the politics and power regimes in India just as what is used in Europe simply for the reason we have a different historical trajectory than that of Europe or of America. Thank you.